There's always wins and there's always losses. It's train tracks. There's always joy and there's always tears. It's continual through our life. Anybody ever go through something? Just lift your hand in this room. We've all been through something, right? And you could look at the past and, 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 and you could see the, the, the blessings and you could see the curses and, and you could look at the fo- future and you could think, man, there's hope or you could be hopeless. It depends on where you are with Christ, I believe, with all my heart. And so we don't seek suffering, but what I do find is sometimes suffering is due to our decisions. Anybody ever make a decision that caused suffering in your life? But if anybody in here ever struggled with suffering and you did nothing wrong, it's the train tracks. It's maybe family. Something happened and you, you are a result or, or you, are a, you, are, you know, the rock was thrown in your pond and you get the ripples. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And so where is, where is God when this happens? And I think we got to find some anchors and we got to really understand that God is there with us and we're going to talk about that. And through James 5, I pray that, that God will use this to let you have a lens to look to your suffering and, and not just ignore it, but find God through it. Find God in your suffering. And, and, and so when we do this, we, 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 did, we, we understand that God is working for us and that God's going to get glory. And if it's not good, God's not done. Somebody say amen. I just believe that. Because the Bible teaches us, you've got to find some anchors to stand on. And the Bible teaches us that, that he works to good, for the good of those who love him. And so if you love him, he's working for you. I just find sometimes in our suffering, it's our perspective and we struggle with it. And there's two views in James, and we're in James chapter 5, verse 7. And the first view I want you to catch this morning is this, that God's harvest is coming. God's harvest is coming. There is a day that's coming. Look at verse 7. It says, here's the theme of it, be patient. I can't stand that word. I think the speed limit is a recommendation for you slow people. Because if it wasn't there, you'd be going slower than that. I, 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 like, I like fast, faster, and fastest, right? And so patience is not one of my giftings. He says, be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until we receive the early and the late rains. Verse 8, you also be you just told me to be patient. We're talking about also be patient, right? I think he's telling us this. He's going to say it again because we're bad at what? Patience. We're bad at it. Some of y'all are like, Pastor, hurry up. We got to beat the Baptist to the restaurant, right? Here's what he says. In your patience, in your time, in your time of struggle, in your time of, of waiting for a harvest, in your time for waiting for fruit, for results, here's what he says. Establish your hearts. Establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord is at hand. You know, in human history, uh, we find that, that all of human history is a lot like farming. We cannot hurry anything up. Anybody realize that? You cannot make fruit grow faster. You cannot, you know, they'll do things to make it bigger. And, but can I tell you something? There's due season that that fruit has to sprout. There's due season for fruit, and we have to respect the season, and we cannot rush the harvest. But in the midst of our season of of suffering, we need to establish our hearts. We need to figure out what is our anchor, what are some scriptures we're going to stand on. I know that God is not just a God in heaven who watches over everything, or, or it does he? I don't know. Is he up there watching and he don't care? No, no, no. I know that God is not just a God. God is my Father, and he loves me. He loves me so much that he could have written it in the sky for me, but he didn't. He sent his only son to show me. He loves you. He cares for you. He knows the number of heads on, uh, hairs on your head or your chin, whatever, whatever it needs to be. Mine's not a hard guess. But he tells us in verse 7, be patient. He talks about being patient. Verse 8, he says, be patient. Verse 9, he says, be patient. In verse 10, he says, be patient. In verse 11, he says, be steadfast. Have steadfastness. One of the great joys and one of the great pains of being a pastor is I get a front row to everybody's life in our church. I have to be on the front row sometimes with people and I get to see things and I get to celebrate the joyous occasions but I also get to experience the pains. And when you do this and you have a heart for God and a heart for people, uh, like in that tent yesterday praying for people, man, I just was broken, just broken. I you know, sometimes just had to walk away for a minute and just gather myself and just pray to God. And 
I think about going through suffering, because can I tell you something? Being a pastor does not keep me from suffering. Being a pastor, there's a target on my back, there's a target on my family, there's been attacks, there's been all kind of stuff. And then when your, your family or your spiritual family gets attacked or they're going through things or addictions and divorce and struggles and heartaches, I get to be on the front row of that and it's, it's a painful thing. There's many nights that I've had to deal with some of you and what you've been going through and what you're having to deal with and I lose sleep and I lay there at night and pray for you and, and just struggle because I know that you're hurting. And, and so in the midst of all that, I remember Hebrews 2.10. It tells us that for it was fitting that he, Jesus, for whom by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation, watch this, perfect through what? Suffering. Perfect through suffering. We have to establish our hearts because in our suffering, God is doing something. God may not have brought your suffering on you, but he'll use it to bring him glory and to bring you character, to bring you patience, to bring you stronger faith. I told the young man that came and talked to me this Friday, we spent the morning together and, and he was talking about I'm struggling with deconstructing things and, and I'm just wanting to break everything down and I don't know, I'm just struggling in my faith. And I said, you know what, you gotta have some anchors. You gotta establish your heart because you're gonna always be shifted. You're always gonna be going through things. You will figure things out in your 20s and then you hit your 30s and realize you didn't know anything. I tell my boys all the time, be careful what you stand on at 22 because at 42 you'll look back and go, that 22 year old was a fool. And we all endure things. And God is all powerful. We have to understand this. God is all knowing. And, and, and all, God, uh, all God wants to do is to be there for us and help us because listen, when you say, well God, where are you and why am I suffering? Understand God is doing something. I want to remind you that on day one, two, and three even, that Jesus, whenever he was in the tomb, people walked by and saw the stone on the, on the tomb and said, God, where are you? What are you doing? God was doing something. And on the third day, Jesus rose. But can I tell you something? A lot of people lost hope during that time. They didn't understand it. And so God is all powerful. So why is there suffering? Why is all this? I find that in atheism, uh, their answer is, by the way, it's no comfort. It's just an answer. But their answer is there is no God. There is no God. And, and we see in atheism that they, they have to borrow from God to even live their life. And my question to atheists, well, atheists is, why do you want ju social justice? Why, well, how do you express love? How do you, we need God for that. God gives us those intangibles. In the finite Godism, uh, they say God is not all powerful. He's like you and I, he's helpless. I don't know about you, but I don't wanna serve a God who's helpless. I can serve me just fine. The evolutionary Godism, this is this open theism, they believe that God is all knowing, but he can't do nothing about it. In pantheism, we find God is, is not all good. He's not all good. In subjective, uh, subjectivism, there's no suffering, um, there is no suffering or evil. It's just subjective. It, it's just, uh, it's subjective until you get hit by a car. There is no objective truth. It's your truth and my truth. And my question is, is that true? I love it when they say that. Well, there's your truth and my truth. Well, is that true? Was that an objective statement? <laughs> and, and you find in Christianity, though, God is not done so we patiently live by faith. We have to patiently, come on somebody, say patiently live by faith. There's a harvest coming. There's a, we, our hope is not in, in the fact that, that uh, he might return. Our hope is in the one who is returning. His name is Jesus. There is a God. He's all-knowing. There, there is no, uh, God is not good and evil. God is a good God. He's a father. He loves us. And we got to make sure that while we're in this time establishing our heart, we don't pick fruit too early. Anybody ever pick fruit too early? It don't taste good, does it? We get impatient. And you know, whenever they would go pick the harvest, you know what would happen? Branches would fall. And you know what they would do with the branches? They'd throw the branches in the fire because the branches aren't good for anything because they detached from the tree, from the source. we got to wait on the harvest. Here's the second thing I want to tell you is God's judgment's coming too. Some of you have been through some things and you're like, God, where are you? And God says, vengeance is mine. You and I don't do vengeance well. I'm not good at judging people. 
That's why we go out there, and I said this, that we don't go look down at people. We look up to Jesus. We go out there not with judgment, with mercy. We don't go out there and say, you know, I bet if they wasn't on drugs or I bet if this, they could get shoes. No, 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 no. That's the judgmental world. The mercy of God is somebody needs shoes, we get them. We put them on feet. We love people. That's what, that's what this is all about. James 5, 9 says, Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Here's what I find, too. Suffering people become selfish people. You ever get into a place of woe is me and you think you're the only one dealing with it? Then all of a sudden you get around somebody that you're glad you don't have their story? Suffering people, we got to be careful. We can become selfish people. Suffering people can become leaky people. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You can't have a conversation without hearing what kind of victim you are. And see, if you're anchored in Christ, we're not victims, we're victors. Come on, somebody. I may be going through it right now, but you better know my God's working it out. My God's coming against my enemies. My God is, he's getting ready to do good things in my life because whenever he does, I'm going to give him the glory. It's all going to be for him. I find that suffering people can become judgy people. We got to be careful with this. We all suffer. We all go through things. We all have battles. And we got to remember to anchor ourselves, establish our hearts in God. Because when we do suffer, we got to wait for the harvest. Because whatever you're going through, you can tell yourself, it may not be good right now, but I have a God, a Father in heaven who loves me, and he's working it out. I don't know what it's going to look like. And by the way, not everything God works out for you is going to look like what you think it should have looked like. God knows what's best. Jesus is the judge for you in your situations. Let people be. People are going to be judgy. People are going to hurt you. People are going to do those things. Say, Jesus, I give them to you. Because Jesus is the judge. And you will be judged by Jesus. Here's what I find. Nobody goes out and advertises their own sin. We always like to point out everybody else's. We like to criticize everything being led, but we don't want to serve anything. Isn't that what we do? You will never see a picket going on. You will never see a riot going on. You will never see a a, a group of people gather on the plaza promoting their sin. They're going to promote someone else's sin. Do what you can do and wait for God to do what only he can do. I spoke to someone this morning and I said this I said this actually three times because I believe this with all my heart watch this church when you don't know what to do do what you know to do when you don't know what to do do what you know to do pray seek God's face read his word go to work lead your family love your wife love your children men come on somebody say amen I don't know what to do right now. Don't go buy a Corvette and go look for a 20-year-old girlfriend, man. Your midlife crisis will get through to the other side, and then you got to figure out how to pay for the 20-year-old and your wife. Come on. This is true. Do what you know to do. Don't get in this depressive state and, and, and listen. Be a worshiper. We're going to worship and respond at the end of this. And worshiping is singing praises to God. It's singing the scripture. It's how we respond to God. It's saying, God, I am not in control. You are in control. So I'm going to praise the one who's in control. And I'm going to magnify him. Because when I magnify him, my problems become smaller. But here's what we do. We magnify the problems and God becomes smaller. We got to learn to magnify him. James 5 verse 10 says it this way. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those, verse 11, blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard the steadfastness of Job. Oh, we don't want to talk about Job, man. That's a tough one. You have seen the purpose of the Lord and how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Verse 12, but above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or on earth by any other oath, but let your yes be yes. In other words, do what you know to do. Do what you said yes to. Boy, that'll preach. Well, pastor, I say yes when I want to serve. That's why nobody can count on you and you don't get put on a schedule. Nobody counts on you. 
Well, I, 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 I do it when I want to. Well, here's the problem. When you can't be counted on, then you, you get mad because you're not part of what's going on. Can I say something? We had some churches that said, how come we weren't invited to this? You were. You're just out of relationship with all the other churches because you're a territory and not a ministry. We, this is, we got to do this all together. Let me tell you something, man. I, I'd get out there and I'd pray with somebody and I'd tell them, I said, do you have a home church? And they said, no, we don't. I said, oh, let me get you a list of churches. Boy, we got some good churches here. Do you know this church? That's Pastor so-and-so. Oh, love that guy. He's awesome. And you know what I'd go through? And you know what I didn't promote was our church. And they said, well, where do you pastor? And I'd tell them. And you know what they would tell me half the time? Oh, I live right across the street over here. I was like, come on. But I, I, I was not afraid to say, hey, let's find you a church. And so you got to let your yes be yes. So you got to, it goes on, it says, and let your no be no so that you may not fall under condemnation. He goes on, he starts talking about ministry here. But let me go back real quick because I do want to tell you about Job. We all know about Job. And if you don't know about Job, Job is somebody who had some suffering. Matter of fact, he had some friends that sat around him for seven chapters, didn't say anything. Then they opened their mouth and then they start running him down. Well, you had to do something wrong. The Bible says at the beginning, though, that Job was found blameless and righteous. And they kept saying, well, you got some sin in your camp. That's why you're suffering. Something's wrong. You got something going on, man. They were terrible friends, right? But I love this. Even in the midst of his suffering, Job says that I am going to serve the Lord. His wife said, hey, won't you just curse God and die? He said, I can't do that. He said, I'm going to serve God no matter what. Even in his suffering, Job said, God, I don't understand it, but I know who you are and I trust you. And we find that Job gets everything back. In this last part of James, as I get ready to conclude here, I want to share with you a couple of things. But he talks about we got to put our faith to work. You know, I, I don't know what's going on in your life when you're suffering, but here's what I do know. I do know whenever you're going through a hard time, the worst thing you can do is backtrack from church and serving. The worst thing you could do, you know what? When I'm going through some things and I, I tell God, God, I feel real lost right now. God, I'm really struggling with this. God, I don't understand why you're allowing this. You know what I do? I make sure I tithe still. I make sure I serve still. I make sure I still prepare ministry sermons. I make sure that I still love on people. I make sure I, I do what I know to do in the midst of these things because listen, just because my emotions are messed up and I'm a mess right now or I'm burdened or I'm struggling, it does not mean that God changes and I can stand on that rock. I was in miry clay and he took my feet and put me on a solid rock, a foundation that I can stand on. And so if you're going through something this morning, I'm telling you, it's not, here's what the enemy wants to do. If you ever look at the, uh, the, uh, the African uh, buffalo, they're out there and, and the lions will go around and just sort of, they'll just sort of roar and, and sort of like uh, just be present and, and it spooks the buffalo and eventually they'll spread, they'll just run. Well, the herd will go left when one will go right. And guess who the lion always goes after? The one who went alone. Listen, church, you need to understand this. It's always the banana that leaves the bunch that gets peeled. When you're going through something, the enemy will bring things again. By the way, Jesus, one of the promises of the, of the Word of God is there will be bad days. Jesus said there's going to be troubles. There's going to be heartaches. Mama said there would be days like this. Jesus, listen, Jesus promised us there's going to be bad days. What we can't do is run away from the herd. We need the fellowship of the church. We need to serve. We need to, and you're like, well, pastor, I just, it's been a long time. I'm hurt. I've been doing this. The longer you stay out, the longer you keep isolated, the more the enemy will pick you apart. By the way, there's a difference between isolation and solitude. Now, I'm a big Superman fan. Can I preach for a minute here? I'm a big Superman fan. I, love, I grew up loving, I was the kid in the underwear with a towel around my neck trying to jump off the porch roof, right? But watch this. Superman always went to the fortress of solitude to do what? Go and be with his father. There's a difference. When you isolate yourself, you get alone with your sinful thoughts, with your suffering, with your leakiness, with your judgy attitude. We get, I'm bad by myself. 
But when I go to solitude with God, I hear from him and he fills me up. And what Superman always do when he come back from the, the fortress of solitude, he whooped any enemy he could face. He got whooped by him, then he went to the fortress of solitude and he stayed with his father and spoke to him for a while and came back and said, I can whoop these guys. It's the same principle there. Isolation is not the same. James goes on in verse 13, and, and we're going to talk about this. We're going to ask, I want you to think about who are you in this crowd? Wh which one are you? Uh, who is suffering, he talks about. James 5, 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. You know what we tend not to do? Is say, God, what do I need to be doing in this time of my problems? God, what do I need to do in this time of my suffering? And what we usually do is we say, God, why? Instead of, God, what do I need to be doing? What do I need to be thinking? How do I need to be living my life right now? God, I need to hear from you. Prayer is talking to the Father, and it's listening to the Father. Prayer is talking to your Father. Some of you only pray to God when you need to understand He's not just God. He's your Father. He loves you. He cares for you. He wants to help you. God does not need you to pray. We need prayer. God is not absorbing energy and power from our prayers. You are. Prayer helps you. Prayer transfers your burdens to someone who can do something about it. Aren't we bad about telling everybody everything wrong about everything in the world? It can't nobody, the people you talk to, none of them can do anything about it. Well, if I was president. Can I tell you something? Joe at McDonald's drinking coffee with you is not going to change anything about who the president is or what's going on in our nation. All we do is stir our Kool-Aid. Prayer is inviting the great physician to enter into your situation and do what nobody else can do. So prayer transfers. Prayer empowers us. Prayer, it, it, it invites God into the situation. And watch this. Prayer delivers us from our suffering and delivers us through our suffering. Because when I pray, I get in tune and know I have a Father who loves me. And the Word of God builds my faith and hope is restored in me. You know what I prayed over everybody yesterday? God, let their home be filled with joy and patience and kindness and love and, 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 and hope. But that's only found in Jesus Christ. You can't find it anywhere else. On Jesus' final breath in Luke 23, it says, Jesus called out with a loud voice and said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having breathed his last breath, or, and, 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 and having this, said this, he breathed his last breath. Even on the cross of death, he invited God into the situation. He said, I give you my soul. Because listen, God's in control of it all. We need to learn to lean into him and trust him. If Jesus needed to pray... How much more do we need to pray? So if you're suffering today, know that. So who's suffering in this room? I'm wondering. Let me ask this. Who's cheerful in this room? Who maybe right now you're not in the area where you're like, Pastor, my life's going pretty good. I'm cheerful. James says, is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Let him sing praise. Let him be a worshiper. Your worship can change people around you. Your worship can change the atmosphere in your car, in your home. Singing is a way of processing and responding there's something powerful about music even secular music there is something powerful about it and we're going to respond after this and we're going to worship god and we're going to just move into that atmosphere and let it change some things uh, singing is a way of praying we sing scriptures singing is a way of watch this emotionally maturing because usually when we're suffering or going through something we want to go and sulk and tell everybody about it can I tell you something? Some of the greatest hymns ever written were through the, the slave days of the blacks in the fields picking cotton and being beaten and singing to their God. And some of the most powerful words were scripted from them giving God praise in the midst of their torment. Jews being led into furnaces and singing praises to their God. Some of the most powerful songs ever written were in times of suffering and hardship. And it matures us. Singing is a way of celebrating. Come on, happy birthday. You know what I'm talking about? That's a terrible song, but you know what I mean. It's not, it's not really upbeat. James 5.14. I'm going to get over here and conclude this. In verse 14, he says, Is anyone among you sick? 
Let him call for the elders of the church. Let him pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. Verse 15, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. Man, praying allows us to deal with reality. You ever just pray to God and say, God, you know, because I find this, watch this. I can be very vulnerable with God to where I can't be very vulnerable with a lot of people in my life. You know what I'm talking about? God, I want to kill him. Well, if I say that out loud, I'm going to jail. I got a, a warrant on my, you know, my head or whatever. You know, yeah. There's things I can tell God that I can't tell other people. There's emotions that are raw that I can come to God. I can come to God and say, God, I'm lost and I don't even know if you love me. God, I don't know. Did you call me? Is this, I mean, I can get really raw with God. It allows us to deal with re, uh, reality. Prayer allows us to be empathetic. It allows us to be empathetic because I can look through Scripture and find where people in Scripture and in my life went through the same thing. It, it allows us to be empathetic. Prayer allows us to support. But I also love this. Prayer should move you to do something. People that say this all the time to me. Well, Pastor, I've been praying. What are you doing? Because if your prayer doesn't have feet, your prayers are not going to do anything. Right? God, heal me. Put that Big Mac down. If no shouting, move on. Okay. Let me ask this. Who in this room, now don't raise your hands all at one time. I'm, I'm, don't raise your hand at all. Who in this room is sinning? Who in this room is living in rebellion to God? James 5.15 says, and if he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven. Isn't that awesome that Jesus will forgive us? You say, oh, Pastor, you don't know what I've done. I don't, but he does, and he said he'd forgive you. But wa watch this. Anyone in here that thinks you've done too much and God can't forgive you, I want to show you something that's a pride issue. Watch this. You are putting your throne above God's, and you're saying your sin's greater than he is. No, no, no. God is all forgiving. He's merciful. He's waiting for you. Verse 16, therefore, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. I love that. Do you know we confess our sins to Jesus and only Jesus for forgiveness of sins? I'm going to say that again. We confess our sins to Jesus and only Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. But James just told us we confess our sins to one another for healing. Hey, I need to talk to you. This has been going on in my life, and I need some accountability. I need to shed some light on this. I need somebody to come alongside me and mentor me and hold me accountable. It'll heal you. Some, but not all, sicknesses from sin. There are some things in your life that you're struggling with that is from sin. Sin caused it. But there are some things in your life that didn't cause sin, uh, didn't cause that. I prayed for people in that tent yesterday that had some stuff going on in their life that they had nothing to do with. It was on them. It was on somebody else who threw a rock in their pond, and it rippled. Sin causes physical problems. Abuse to your body. Come on. I think we've all been there. We abuse our body. We say, well, I can't sleep at night. That's because you drink 17 cups of coffee, and all you do is drink Dr. Pepper. Your body doesn't know how to shut down. Right? I heard Dr. Phil say, you're fat because you want to be fat. Man, I, I was upset, man. I cleaned that Twinkie out of my teeth, and I said, he don't know me. Misuse of the body. Can't. I'm glad somebody understood what I'm talking about. By the way, sin causes mental and emotional problems. Stress, bitterness. Some of you in this room have not forgiven somebody. And it's causing, it's like you're, you're hoping that you drink poison and they die. And you're stressed. You're hurting. You're burdened. And, and you're worried about things that aren't even here yet. Some of you are worried about things that's coming on to my, one of the, the best pieces of advice I've ever had, and I'm trying to live in that, wherever my feet are, let my mind be there too. Because some of you can't even play with your children on the floor because you're worried about something going to happen tomorrow. And then we turn around, our kids are gone, and we're, then, we, then we have guilt because we didn't spend time with our children. This is the mental abuse that sin can do. Sin causes spiritual problems. Sin will cause bondage in your life. It'll cause oppression. It, it, it'll cause uh, you to have addictions. It'll cause these things. Listen, if you're sinning, you need wise counsel, and the Word of God is our wise counsel. You need to ask somebody in your life, hey, man, I'm really struggling with this. I, I had a phone call this morning, and the conversation went like this. Hey, I'm really struggling with this thing. 
And I had to start talking about what we need to be put our focus on. Because you need wise counsel. You need people in your life. You know what men are horrible at? We're horrible about, about letting people in. Men are horrible about worshiping. Because here's what men look like at worship. We don't let people in. That's why you're dying at 50 with a heart attack. We're so stressed, and we don't know how to give God things. Here's another one. Who's weary? Verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. If you're weary, pray. Give it to God. He will completely help you out with your temptations, with your exhaustions, with your frustrations. In Luke chapter 3, verse 21, when Jesus had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were open, the Holy Spirit descended on him on a bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Whenever he knew his mission, he knew what he was here for, and he needed to hear from his Father. We need to hear from our Father. Somebody say amen. We need to hear from our Father. Who is doubting? Verse 17. Elijah was a man with, with, with a nature like ours. He prayed fervently that it might not rain. For the three years and six months, it did not rain. Verse 18, then he prayed again, and the heavens rained, uh, gave, gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Uh, you remember Elijah, he was battling Ahab and Jezebel and all these prophets. And we see Elijah raise someone from the dead, and he was fed by the angels in the wilderness, and, and birds brought him food. And, and we see in Elijah's life, he had chariots of fire that took him to heaven this man saw some cool stuff he was a superhero to these kids at that time and but the Bible says Elijah was just like you and me just like you and me and I want to say something to you and I want you to catch this Elijah's problem was he was dealing with a Jezebel spirit now watch this a Jezebel spirit is allowing someone to intimidate you the only thing worse than a Jezebel spirit is the Ahab spirit. He was the king and he allowed it. It was his wife. So what is, what is it causing you these problems in life? What are you intimidated by? If God is for you, who can be against you? You can have the power to overcome anything. And then at the last of this, we never forget the lost sheep that James talks about. James 5, 19. He says, my brother, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whatever brings, whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will, will save souls from the death and will cover a multitude of sins. So I just want to deal with, I dealt with so many different people in this room. Where are you at? Are you suffering? Are you cheerful? Are you, what are you struggling with? And here's the last one I want to give you, and we're going to get ready. I want the worship team to come, and we're going to, we're going to respond to God this morning. And I want to challenge you, don't get your stuff ready. Don't walk out of the room. This is the most important three to five minutes of our service. Here's where I find that we suffer. We suffer strongly is a wandering heart. Whenever we don't have God, listen, church, I don't know how people out there do it without Jesus. I don't know how people do it without Jesus. I don't know how they bury people without Jesus. I don't know how they live their life without Jesus. Well, you know what happens when they don't have Jesus? They turn to a life of drugs, alcohol, depression, anxiety, and eventually the enemy wants to kill them. And they deal with suicide. Four ways we wander. Your heart. Our heart gets filled with emotions and we become lukewarm. We deal with life and we get a little hard toward God and next thing you know our hearts wandered and, and maybe you've been hurt by a church and, and your heart's scarred. Can I tell you today, God wants to heal that. God wants to heal that. Another way we wander is our soul. You know what's funny to me is, we don't, never, we don't, we don't practice feeding our soul. In, I, I, let me show you something, I, I wanna measure this and I just want you to pay attention and I'm almost finished, I promise you, watch this. Brother, that's just going to leave big old white stuff all over my head. I need my towel. I do this. If I wipe it, I get like white stuff all over my head. Like dandruff and I ain't got no hair. Here's what's interesting. We don't feed our soul. Before you tune out on me, give me just another minute. We don't feed our soul. Many of you know right now what percentage of battery your phone has, but you have no idea how your soul's doing. We don't feed our soul. You got to nurture it with a personal relationship with God. 
You nurture your soul by responding to his word in worship. You nurture your soul by serving others. You nurture your soul by doing a check on it. You know, your, your car has a dash, and if the oil gets low, it has a red light that comes on. When your fuel gets low, it'll ding at you. Some of you don't even hear your soul's dashboard anymore. You gotta learn to feed your soul because you're not a body with a soul, you're a soul with a body. The third way we wander is our mind. We wander into false teaching. I, I, was, I tried to ask somebody to pray yesterday. I said, hey man, is there anything I can pray with you? And he said, no, no, I'm good. And I was like, hey, do you have a home church? He goes, nah, I said, I believe all religions have their own ways and none of them really lead anywhere. And I was like, okay, the false teaching, we believe stuff. And I guarantee if you let me sit down with him, I'd find out he had a church hurt. He had, a, he had an experience somewhere. We let, our, we let our minds wander into false teachings. We believe things that are not true. Well, I had one pastor tell me, if the Word of God didn't tell you, I don't care if it was your mama. The Word of God is your authority. Don't wander in your mind. The last way we wander is strength. We get weary. Watch this. Some of you are doing things you were never called to do. And you're wondering why in the world your life is falling apart. Some of you are frustrated because you're not doing the thing that you're supposed to be doing. And you're weary in your strength. And when you're weary in your strength, that's when you fall into addictions. That's when you fall into stuff. You don't have strength for your marriage, then you're doing some things wrong. You don't have strength for your children, you're doing some things wrong. If you don't have strength to come and worship God on Sunday, you're doing something wrong. We need to get out of doing all this stuff that God never, you know, we come to God, God, oh, I'm just overburdened, I'm weary, oh Lord, I'm just tired. And God said, I didn't call you to do half the stuff you're doing. You're wanting me to give you strength, but I didn't, I didn't release you in this stuff you're doing. You're doing stuff that I never called you to do. Here's a question we can ask as we respond. God, what are you asking me to do? Watch this. God, what are you telling me not to do? As we respond, I want you to know God's your father and he has a relationship with you. He wants to speak to you. It's not good for us to avoid him. And the last thing I'll say is, I'm gonna let the worship team pray, we're gonna worship, we're gonna respond, is this. When it comes to us suffering, when it comes to us, wherever we're at in our life, whatever walk we're going through, our answer is always Jesus. It always is, it always is. You may feel like God doesn't understand you, but can I tell you something? He created you and he understands you better than you do. The problem is you've got lost in, in some identity or something you're doing on this earth that you were never called to do. And God wants to walk you through whatever season you're in right now. And watch this, I found this out. When it comes to suffering, listen to me church, you're either coming into that season of suffering, you're in a season of suffering, or you're coming out of a season of suffering. Because in a broken world, we're going to be suffering. But it's not over. God's working on something right now, and the harvest is coming. And when he returns, he'll wipe every tear from every eye. He'll take care of every problem you had in this life, and you won't have it anymore, because God said, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. They walked by the tomb, too, on day two. and thought, they thought it was over, but I'm working on it. Hang tight. Can we right now with every eye closed and every head bowed? We're gonna sing and we're gonna respond and I wanna ask you, what season are you in? And I want you to ask God, what am I supposed to be doing? What am I not supposed to be doing? And if you don't know Jesus as your personal savior and you heard these words today, only God saves. If he's drawing you, I want you to ask him to come into your life and forgive you of your sins.